All right, welcome everyone to our session to today on um, decolonizing radical relationism. Um, I would like to start us in a good way by acknowledging where I am uh, in, in the land. I am in the unceded and never surrendered lands of the Tekemlops to Shukwetmek in Shukwetmek Oluk, um, known also as uh, Kamloops, British Columbia in Canada. And I like to start, well, we start by acknowledging territory to remind us um, that we are still today, um, right now, still living in um, within the violence uh, of colonialism and the consequences of colonialism and to also remind everyone that the work that we do and the um, knowledge production that we engage in um, is always in uh, remembering how this is the case and how we can work and do more for decolonizing ourselves and work, the work, the places where we live and our own sense of self and being. Um, today, as I was saying, we're um, discussing this topic that's very much in line with what I was just mentioning. Um, in the program, we have the what the potential of radical relationism is to decolonize knowledge production. And I see that here our discussants this morning are saying decolonize radical relationism itself. Um, very happy to welcome Washak Ceylan, Victor Jimenez, and Benjamin Klasche uh, to the discussion this morning for me, afternoon in Europe and different times everywhere else in the world. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, please, Washak, Victor, and Ben, um, take it away. And if you would introduce yourselves, that would be amazing. Oh, thank you very much, Monica. Um, I think you introduced us already very nicely. Um, I'm from Germany. I think that's important to know uh, in the sense that uh, I'm coming from this from this perspective of a white European. Um, so it's a it's a different one. I think, as you also noted, we changed the topic just slightly. Uh, so we want to decolonize actually radical relationalism. Um, of course, while doing it, we will also touch on uh, some of the aspects, how it can help decolonize other aspects, like knowledge production, as you mentioned. Um, how we kind of imagined the session is we want to give some impulses for discussion mostly. Um, I will talk maybe a little bit broader about the need to decolonize radical relationalism, why I think that is necessary, and maybe why we, and how we can do it. Um, Rashak will take over then and show radical relationalism's potential to be an ally for indigenous studies, but only if it's decolonized. Uh, she will present a, a research paper that uh, we have been working on. And then Victor takes us to the knowledge production and how knowledge production is colonized and what radical relationalism can do here for us. So we're trying to set the stage and then give a couple of ideas. Um, and then we hope to discuss with you. I also hope we are not, it's not gonna take a lot of time. Let's see. Um, so some initial thoughts, radical relationalism is a great thing, we think. Uh, it has a great uh, it has a great chance or opportunity to really zoom in on social transformation of, of societies, especially how we imagine it in our international school of radical relationalism, I think, to really focus on the, the ethics and the politics of it. It also has huge potential, and I think this is where, um, where it can help also to de decolonize other areas is that it can be this key or connector to support this local universalist idea or Mignolo would, would call it this decolonial cosmopolitanism. Uh, Monica, I'm very interested in hear what you are saying about this later. But basically that uh, the only thing that's universal is that there is pluriversality, everything, everywhere it's kind of different, but we are actually connected in this. Uh, and I think radical relationalism can very nicely point towards this but only if it's decolonized. Um, I think it needs to be decolonized at, at least when we practice it or how we kind of, also this group was built on this notion or this field of relational sociology, which has a lot of ties towards uh, 
uh, European white male philosophers. Uh, so a lot of our canon is, well, maybe has the need to be decolonized. This is something we should we should discuss. Um, two kind of strategies how to do it. Um, I've been thinking about this. I haven't really put anything uh, out there, but there are these really great books. I can only recognize, uh, recommend them to everybody here. They're really short, 180 you know, books, uh, page books on decolonizing sociology and decolonizing politics um, from Ali Medji and uh, Ravi Shilliam. And what they say, you know, in a nutshell, <laughs> um, how can we decolonize a subject? Ravi Shilliam says we need to critically examine whether uh, whether this discipline is in embedded in any approach approaches that emerge from the imperial centers, from the colonial centers, um, and whether in these approaches we are still talking about ruling the colonial margins. Um, <clears throat> for example, he has great chapters on Aristotle and Kant, who are often cited in these dis debates, which are, you know, coming out of the imperial centers of their times uh, and marginalizing basically everything around them. So Shilliam says we really need to critically examine this. And I think we need to do this with almost everybody that we usually like to cite in radical relational papers. Um, that's Shilliam's idea. Medji uh, says that there's another option. Um, he actually wrote the book before Shilliam. <laughs> uh, we should engage much more with indigenous or autonomous sociological work. So work that is not at all connected to these imperial centers, has any colonial, colonial baggage, um, but he warns us we should be very careful that we are not now taking this new knowledge, whether it's indigenous or from a marginalized place, and have this become the new overarching hegemonic knowledge tradition. We need to stay true to the pluriversal idea, perhaps this uh, universal localism or pluriversal cosmopolitanism, however we kind of want to call it, and make sure that we are not splitting the world again in colonial center, or now like kind of the decolonialized margin. I'm, I'm wondering how to how we phrase this maybe better, but it's basically pluriversality is kind of the, the answer we are we are looking for. Um, the last thing for me, um, why, and I've thought about this a lot in the context of international relations, that actually radical relationalism can function as this glue or yeah, really the glue between many different knowledge traditions, geographical uh, knowledge traditions, because relationalist tenets are found in basically all local uh, worldviews, philosophies, traditions. Um, so like we have, of course, this kind of radical relational or relational sociologist um, view that arises from the Anglophone tradition. We have a lot of uh, evidence or like academic publishing on how Eastern philosophy, Confucianism, et cetera, is very relational. Um, we have, we see this in many South American traditions, Aboriginal Australian uh, political orders, Native American philosophies, you know, I'm talking to the experts here. So, but relationality is basically everywhere. Uh, and therefore it can be this glue, I think, to, to establish this universalist uh, localism. Now we want to show you one area where we see this relationality. And I would like to pass the word on to to Vashik. Loka da kolema da soila luku taluma ku washak silan inga kunsku kalangulai. Hi everyone, my name is Washak Silan. Um, I am my traditional territory of Dayan people is situated in the northern part of Taiwan, and it is very wonderful to participate in the decolonizing uh, radical relationalism and more uh, seminar. And just to a disclaim uh, to place a disclaimer that I'm not familiar with the radical relationalism before encountering Ben <laughs> one year ago, two years ago. So um, so I am actually like learning, like like in the process of learning of how to to see the whole thing. And um, and this paper that is uh, showing in front of your computer screen is how I get to know this radical relationalism because I've been with, working with relationalities of indigenous peoples as it's everything is kind of in a holistic relationship, but um, I have not used the relationalism vocabulary. So it's very nice to see how radical relationalism, this idea getting um, implemented in this case of Dayan identity, reclamation and language learning. So uh, next slide, please. Yes, so just to give you some context, so indigenous peoples in Taiwan, there are 16 groups recognized by the state 
And my grandmother is one of the group. That's why I'm interested in this thing. And it's about like half a million people that is belong to this group. And um, they're all very different. And the Diane people that we're focusing are 93,000 people of them all. Next. And as you might know that the indigenous people in Taiwan has a very long and multiple um, um, colonizing uh, powers that's coming in. So it's uh, just, I just use this uh, image to show that it is a fitting example uh, when we are talking about decolonization. Next. So as uh, what's happening, the processes of truth and reconciliation that we see in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and also SAPMI here in uh, in Europe, that uh, in Taiwan, we also have an era of Taiwan, this process. And um, in uh, 2017, as you see here, there's the Indigenous Language Development Act, where the Indigenous language are recognized as the national languages. And then Indigenous languages officially recognized as something that we need to cherish and as a national heritage. So we had the apology, national apology in 2016. And indigenous languages are now very important and uphold by the Taiwanese state in the state's eye. And next. So as you can see here, yes. Right. Yes. So, but then with so much recognition from the state, we still only have poor results. Because uh, in 2020, we see that the rapid loss of indigenous languages across indigenous families and across generations and communities are frustrated about the progress on language and revitalization. And we are wondering how come the poor results if the government has put so much effort into it and why communities are frustrated if uh, they're being helped so much. Next. So our answer and our uh, like provocative way of trying to to see this thing and also link to radical relationalism is that well maybe the government's uh, approach is to western and more to substantialist and the second claim is that indigenous language models should really adopt the indigenous Diane's perspective and this kind of relational way of looking at the language learning should be adopted not the the looking at all only the government's uh, this very top down approach. So our upshot is to to give insights on how indigenous uh, Dayan language Khmali and its relations to the Dayan identity. It is not a, a a tool to an end, but it's more like in this constitutive uh, relationship. We will explain more later. So next. So our claim one that we have, uh, so I have conducted some interviews with Dayan elders that's who are living in the northern part of the traditional territory, uh, Dayan territory here. And then we have find out that the, so the government's pedagogy and the language learning model is flawed. It's flawed in a way that is not promoting the Dayan identity reclamation. And we have categorized three themes. So basically the first theme is that it perpetrates the, this colonial legacy that does not address that colonialism has ever happened. And the second is that this language model that the, the government is adopting, it alienates individuals from their identity. The more they teach, it doesn't mean that the more I, the more I, they identify as Diane. And the third one is basically that they are very uh, disrespectful. So the more language instruction that they give, the, the less that the Diane people feel that they're uh, inherent um, cultural tradition is being respected. But the, we don't have time to go into this, so just to show you that claim one include those. So the claim two is that a better indigenous language pedagogy is being overlooked. And we have three themes which we will open up here. Next. So the theme four of our paper is that, well, the government model is not looking at the importance of the immersion of this relational a way of looking at Dayan language. So the positive reflection on this constitutive element of what makes Dayan language so, so important. And we want to look at this uh, Dayan cosmology, which is the also Dayan law that we use the term Gaga. So the Gaga is this kind of relational way of like connecting and making Dayan like um, um, of how like a foundational so it kind of anchors the relationalities of what, what makes uh, 
Dayan feels that we are Dayan. So language is not external to all these relationships, but part of it. So as one of the uh, participants said that the, I think the meaning of that Gaga is like the law and the way of education. So it's very important that, that we consider this not as a mean to an, not, not to treat uh, language learning as a mean to an end, but also like a part of these constitutive, constitutive relations. And next. And the in the in, in this uh, theme, we think that the, it's very important to underline that the Daya model for language instruction is about relationality and interconnection, which is uh, very lacking in the government way of looking at language learning. So, for example, in Dayan, we have this uh, um, traditional uh, oral history or like singing map, as you understand. Um, in, in we are we call this Kwaslamahu. And Lamahu basically uh, is used when the elders are passing down a part of our history that they want the um, the younger people to remember. So, so, so doing this, we learn the language. But learning language is not something that we imagine outside of ourselves. But it's about uh, embracing that your identity as Dayan and you also practicing this. Um, so, so this is very different from the Western model. And the connection to land is also very important as uh, we have a video here, but then hopefully if you're interested, you can check it out. So this elder was basically doing this Lamahu oral, like a uh, history um, singing and chanting, and then is connecting his identity and the Dayan language, and also the, his relation to the land through, through doing this. Uh, yes. And the theme six is about building intergenerational connections. So learning Dayan is not just about grammars and syntax, but it's mainly for us very important about strengthening and rebuilding the relationship also intergenerationally and also with the environment. Because in our vocabulary, we use the same words and same terminologies of uh, describing the parts of our body and also this different places in the environment. So there is no strong distinction between these two. And learning Dayan language should be building this, like rebuilding these connections. So we want to also to emphasize that the, the, this intergenerational and also uh, between human or non-human kind of relationship is very important and part of the learning of the languages. Next. So I will give it back to <coughs> Ben to wrap it up on... <laughs> How, what yeah. does all the, this mean? So here, I just want to quickly talk about why radical relationalism can also help us understand this better, these connections. Um, and we basically say, if you apply it uh, diligently, you have a certain ethical responsibility to center on relations that matter to the, uh, to the people. Um, and while doing this, you will actually make sure that colonial uh, violence is not reproduced if you center the relations that, that matter. Um, and by that, you also actually have certain methodological tools in a way that come with it. So radical relationalism struggles with clearly choosing which relations to study because there are so many and they're always ch changing and always expanding. But you should focus on the relations that matter. So the relations between inter, between generations, the relations between people and the land, and the relations between people and the, and the, and the law, the uh, gaga. So this is something radical relationalism can teach us here. Um, also, uh, I tried my way here with the, with the paint. <laughs> that basically at the top you see the the government's approach, which is a substantialist kind of straightforward causal way of identifying or understanding identity. We increase the language proficiency, so very substantial understanding of language, which will lead to stronger identity. But in a relational, radical relational way, and also especially in a more constitutive, uh, seeking constitutive explanations, um, which to me is something inherent to radical relationalism, maybe we can disagree, <laughs> that all these things matter. Himali, the language matters. Gaga, the law where I'm doing this. Rigrek, uh, the mountains matter. And all of them are constituting Tayal identity. And at the same time, you know, the language doesn't make any sense outside of, of the environment, outside of the, of the, of the law. Um, so we actually need to look a much more complex situation. This is where radical relationalism can help us. Of course, indigenous approaches have figured this out too. 
Um, but it's maybe a little bit like Vashak mentioned, there is a certain vocabulary that can come from radical relationalism, um, you know, maybe a certain way of opening these discussions up to a more Western crowd who does not want to think in these in these ways. But it's also very important, actually, for radical relationalism. So our paper, it ends with this suggestion that uh, radical relationalism could be an ally to indigenous studies. That's the way we phrase it. Um, because they can borrow some, they can lend some vocabulary, perhaps, or something like this. But even more importantly, indigenous studies can be an ally to radical relationalism to help it decolonize. So I said in the beginning, one of Meji's ideas to decolonize the discipline is to get closer to indigenous studies and kind of have them decolonize you uh, with their knowledge, with their uh, understanding of the world. And I think actually this is, again, a constitutive relationship between indigenous studies and radical relationalism that uh, that here um, could work. So this is just the question we pose at the end of the paper. Uh, we, we didn't dare to yet to fully say this is the way it is, but uh, that hopefully uh, next. Uh, and now uh, Victor is going to talk us about the knowledge production, the colonized aspect of it. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so in my part, I want to focus in on actually how we produce um, or how knowledge is produced on um, on indigenous and uh, marginalized communities and how this is essentially um, a process that is both uh, colonial and essentializing as these um, these two concepts often go um, hand in hand. Um, so here I want to talk about how uh, the production of knowledge on indigenous societies um, by the hegemonic actors in their uh, broader societal context always um, tends to essentialize and um, the, to essentialize its subject and to reproduce um, colonial ideas of the relations between this subject, so uh, in this case, um, the, the Taiyao people and the wider societal context of um, of Taiwan. But we see um, we see this a lot in relations between um, indigenous people and um, governments in North America and in Latin America, and um, be also between the majority populations and um, regional minorities in places like uh, Europe. Um, so um, here, what I want to bring up is that um, concepts of culture, language, identity, history, and uh, so on are fitted into um, separate boxes that are essentialized and that can be learned in the hegemonic groups um, school settings um, and this perpetuates this uh, vision of integration as the as the state's goal in the educational system and by integration what is usually meant is the uh, essentially the erasure of the uh, colonized people's identity and their incorporation into the colonizers um, culture even with uh, minor concessions, so to speak, such as the maintenance of um, of their language or of certain aspects of culture, but uh, within a situation in which these aspects of their culture are completely decontextual, uh, decontextualized, um, as the examples that uh, Ben and uh, Vashek uh, brought up before, um, these. Um, Decontextualization is um, is done by taking these aspects of the indigenous culture outside of the environment and understanding them as essences. So instead of uh, viewing the language, the identity, the, the physical environment as uh, parts of a cohesive whole, these are seen as uh, separate um, separate categories to be learned and. Um, so a language instruction, for example, is done by uh, memorizing word lists, learning grammatical rules, and taking the language outside of the context in which it exists, which is the uh, reality of the indigenous culture. And this at large then ignores the uh, relation relationality of indigenous identity and um, also of the structural power relations 
uh, that uh, legitimize themselves by integrating, by incorporating these uh, indigenous um, peoples and their identity into the hegemonic society in the hegemon's own terms. Uh, so these, um, these small uh, trinkets such as um, allowing for the learning of the language and and so on are presented as uh, as concessions that the hegemonic society gives uh, to the indigenous people. And so I uh, so I highlighted here in my slide these uh, policy making uh, that results from this understanding, which is often, as I said, very substantially. So it treats this, and I also wanted to add here uh, the language of wicked problems. So it treats the a uh, wicked problem of the maintenance of indigenous identity within uh, this hegemonic colonizer society as a simple problem. Um, so so uh, to put it in very simple terms, it is, uh, as we saw a couple of slides before, it is the problem as um, uh, the descendants of uh, these indigenous communities don't uh, know their ancient language. Therefore, we're going to teach the language problem solved, whereas in reality, if we're not taking all of these contexts and all of these relations into account, this is a very incomplete policy. So I want here also to take a look at the issue of agency and structure in knowledge production. So as, uh, as I also talked in the uh, previous meeting, um, this is something that I uh, take into account a lot in my research, and I see it as a uh, very intimately um, related, so um, structural power relations of um, colonizer and colonized uh, enable by uh, their material and ideological basis, they enable the colonizer to speak on behalf of the colonized and to decide um, what is best for the colonized. So the ways in which uh, the um, colonized subjects, identity, culture, and language, and so on can be man maintained are defined in terms uh, of the colonizers and essentialized in these ways that, um, that I mentioned before. So, um, so that knowledge production on these societies is um, completely decontextualized from the realities of the um, of indigenous people, and it is created by outsiders, by colonizers, on behalf of um, of what are perceived as uh, colonized subjects, and. Um, this leads to the legitimation of the status quo of these uh, of these relations uh, through the tacit acceptance uh, of some aspects of indigenous identity on the colonizer's ter uh, colonizer's terms. So this would be the concessions uh, that I talked about before, where um, the colonizer uh, the colonized are completely stripped of their identity and their identity is taken out of its context, but some. Uh, carefully selected aspects of it are allowed to live on to legitimize the colonizer as as accepting of the uh, colonized identity. So uh, going back here for a moment to the imposition of these uh, Western language uh, instruction model that uh, Ben and Vashek uh, talked about before, um, by imposing these, uh, this instruction model, um, even when done with uh, a good intention of uh, recognizing the indigenous people's rights to maintain its uh, language and culture, this is done in a way that is inherently uh, colonial, uh, neglecting indigenous ways of knowing and perpetuating um, the culture of the colonizers by essentially incorporating uh, these um, selected aspects of the colonized culture into its own uh, ways of knowing and of being. And um, I would argue then that by incorporating or integrating the colonized culture into the colonizers' ways of knowing and of being, this um, indigenous culture is, um, uh, is uh, essentialized and... Um, in, incorporated 
so this develops into um, what I would call a one size fits all uh, model of um, um, of treating indigenous communities by the uh, colonizer, whereby all indigenous cultures are perceived, and this is also a very substantialist uh, and essentializing uh, way of uh, of dealing with it. Uh, all of these um, disparate, uh, diverse, separate cultures are treated uh, in the exact same way and the same uh, kinds of policies are offered to all of them. So um, you will have the opportunity to learn your language within our school system. You'll have the opportunity to maintain some um, uh, some rituals or some aspects of your culture uh, often in a completely decontextualized um, manner and um, and so on and by by doing so and I'll I'll leave it at this so as not to uh, repeat myself too much but by doing so then the aim um, as I perceive it is to produce knowledge on um, these indigenous peoples and their ways of knowing and of being um, in a way that satisfies the colonizers uh, terms and its own identity uh, in many in many ways we see the colonizer presenting its own identity as um, as accepting of diversity and as um, respectful of um, indigenous rights uh, but it's always in its own terms Okay, uh, was that it, Victor? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes, and that, that, those were our impulses for discussion. Ten minutes longer than we thought it would be, but here we are. So yes. Yes. Looking forward to hearing what you have. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this presentation. Very, very interesting and um I was so engaged in looking at all these points you were making, um, such interesting and important research you're doing, Washak, with uh, the Tayal identity and language and, and the way in which the colonial um, ideas just get imposed. There's so many um Topics bubbling up. I wonder if anyone would like to start us with a question, um, a comment, um, just giving a chance for everyone here to um, gather your thoughts and perhaps um, address um, any aspect of what was presented here today for discussion. Oh yeah, you say I see uh, Sultan. I see your hand up, and then Jenna. Thank you. I want to wasik. Uh, I've been. It's it's fascinating to hear all these details, uh, with uh, this tremendous historical background, and I wonder, uh, what you what 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 you would say about the approach to treating, uh indigenous minorities in mainland China, the, does it follow the same logic as the one you've described, you've been describing with relation uh, with regard to um, Taiwan or is it something totally different? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you Susan, for the question. Um, I'm not, a, so just to, uh, to get myself off the hook that I'm not a specialist in the Chinese culture and language, and I'm not a sinologist. So uh, I've worked with sinologists, but I'm not the one. So uh, so I can only say from how I see um, this from the sideline. So I think this um, issue that you bring out is very important. And then I can see it from two aspects. So how the communist um, government is, uh, uh, we can see like whether like on the Han Chinese level of how we see the minorities and how we treat them. And the other side is a more political 
um, way of treating these uh, politic uh, these minorities. So I think looking at the Taiwanese government's way of treating the indigenous peoples, it has been a very long uh, journey to try to push them, see indigenous people not just as yet another minority, but from indigenous people to indigenous peoples, like as a, that is a ratified in the international law. So I think uh, in the in the China, they didn't have that process of like uh, recognizing that indigenous peoples are having any kind of rights. So in that sense, politically, um, I don't think that's uh, that can be um, a see as the same way as the what I presented from the Taiwanese government. But what I see that is quite similar is this very and a chauvinist way of seeing that, oh, their culture is very important. And we have these 5,000 years of like a, um, these like important guys like creating the Chinese culture and this kind of a paternalistic way of treating uh, minorities as they are the majority or their culture is just inherently superior to other cultures. In that sense, it's very similar. But if we don't consider this political process and democratization process that Taiwan is going through, in that aspect, it's a little bit different. So I hope so I make sense. The, the, the common denominator is Han chauvinism. I, I feel so, I mean, but Han. as I said, that I'm not a, a yeah. expert, so I might be completely wrong. So, uh, but that's just how I see uh, when I'm looking at the, the policies and how the policy is, uh, uh, formulated and in the way that it's communicated is quite similar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jenna. Um, yeah, thank you. This was really a, a wonderful way to wake up <laughs> in the, <laughs> excuse me, I have um, the remains of a cold here. I, I think my question is um, related most towards the last um, part of the discussion uh, where we're talking um, really centrally ab about, um, you know, ways in which radical relationism uh, and, and colonization kind of in interlock. And uh, my question really just um, connects up this idea uh, of, of identity and non-essentializing conceptions of identity um, up with a, a piece by uh, Maria Lugonis called uh, Structure, Anti-Structure and Agency Under Oppression. Um, <laughs> and the reason the, the conversation evoked that for me and I wanted to bring it up to for us to maybe think about uh, together um, is because in that piece, uh, Lugan talks about ways in which um, people can at this be at the same time um, the the subjects of ongoing colonial violence and oppression and be participants uh, in the dominant hegemonic culture <laughs> that is causing that very oppression, um, and it's, it was kind of really complicated um, ways in which Indigenous identities are situated within the larger colonial order um, that that uh, I've been reading about and thinking about uh, recently. Um, and so in the in the Canadian, so just for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Maria Lagunas' work, um, she talks about um, uh, circumstances in, in um, uh, South Africa under uh, under uh, apartheid, uh, where one one and the same person is both a powerful matriarch, but also, um, you know, an indentured servant, <laughs> um, and so she talks about that kind of conflicting uh, identity that is embodied in one in one person and through uh, different sets of relationships. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring it up this morning is because it resonates really. Um, strongly, at least for me, with some of the things that um, uh, here the uh, local, um, the Tekemelit Stage Kwapmek people uh, are talking about the, the importance of uh, their metaphors to uh, walking on two legs, that is, um, you know, walking with in, within your indigenous identity, but also within the knowledge structures that colonialism has, has wrought. Um, so here it's walking on two legs uh, in the Mi'kmaq, which is on the eastern side of Canada. They talk about two-eyed seeing, 
Um, and these are really I think, important metaphors for the indigenous epistemologists that, that I've been uh, reading uh, for looking at the, the complex ways in which Indigenous identity is constituted, uh, not just as Indigenous identity, but really as mixed identities, identities that, uh, that have relationships both um, you know, within the colonial order and within traditional Indigenous communities that are trying to reconstitute uh, their, their um, I guess, legal orders as well as um, uh, cultural orders. Yeah, that's that's where I was thinking. I thought I'd throw it out there for folks <laughs> uh, to think about, but it most I think closely connected. Well, probably to the last two talks, where um, you know, as we're thinking about these, it does seem as though um, it's really important to look at at the ways in which relationships are 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 manifold and identity is is manifested by different different patterns of relations. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um comment, Jenna, very, very important to look at the different uh, uh, experiences of Indigenous peoples throughout the world, um, but also realizing that uh, there is much, there's much convergence, there's much, uh, there's, there's differences in, in how different governments and different colonial um, establishments have approached um, the presence of indigenous peoples, um, but also how that affects indigenous uh, peoples' identities and, and ways of being in their own land after colo the violence of colonial rule. Um, to me, I was, uh, and I have my little hand up, um, uh, I, I, I would like to uh, um, offer uh, what I what I saw in this presentation. I really, really liked the approach of decolonizing radical relationism itself, because this is a thing that I've had in my um, thinking about this approach and about this framework in a way. Um, uh, I really like the idea of, of uh, mutual allyship, but also very aware that there is a power differential in looking at this kind of allyship, right? Um, it can be mutual in the sense of um, radical relational um, ethical standing on humility, on humility and knowledge production and on um, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, a commitment to to decolonization and to a uh, pluriverse of ways of knowing and ways of being. Um, but at the same time, very aware as Ben was mentioning that these are uh, ways of thinking that come from uh, uh, Western um, uh, straight white dead guys, generally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That that we use and quote and 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 keep uh, reproducing certain ideas that come from them. I uh, John Dewey comes to mind has been one uh, fellow that has been the center of attention, and even though there's a lot of elements there that are are useful to to this um, perspective, there are issues with embracing that uh, or, or creating a framework that uh, doesn't look at, at, at those legacies. And I really, really appreciate the use of Meji and, 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 and Shilliam in thinking about how it is that we are going to decolonize these disciplines and yet still mentioning and still uh, encased in um, disciplinary bundles that that kind of um, essentialize and substanti substantialize the perspectives in which we look at uh, at these phenomena, where, where when it, when they're actually phenomena that are so complex and and um, s relational with each other, and in that way, uh, uh, mindful that that what I'm that that when I think about Dewey and in, in the um, transdisciplinarity that that he was proposing. It's 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 this approach, it is this relational way of looking at the world in which disciplines are not necessarily uh, separate. Like we separate them, but they're not separate. Um, but but going back to that whole um, sense of uh, 
colonial existence under different regimes, but yet there's convergence there. Um, it, 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 I'm going to quote uh, a friend that I was talking about uh, 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 on this. I was talking about this. Um, and he, his name is, is, is Mark Wallen. He's a colleague here in, in Thompson Rivers. And he's saying, well, if you don't have this, this framework, when you allow that pluriversality uh, or I don't want to say allow, but what, what that pluriversality is not contemplated, what you have is nationalism. And that rang, rang a, 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 something um, interesting for me because that is more of that. The only way is my way. And we have a lot of that today in the world. Um, and also from a power position in the sense that that the way that I say it is, is what rules. And um, the radical relational perspective or more like a decolonized radical relational perspective should really be more of an ally to the uh, uh, different ways of knowing and different ways of being in the world. And the other part that I wanted to comment on was uh, on foregrounding language and specifically indigenous languages associated to identity and how it is that that language is lived in the world. And to that, I wanted to uh, make the connection uh, of that biological relationship of our embodiment with living languages and um, how we can uh, uh, present language not as um, you know e proficiency in language, and therefore we're 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 per uh, uh, per you know we're conserving the language in this kind of very simplistic colonial way of looking at them. But it's more like a living the language in the land. As and you said something there, uh, Washak, uh, with respect to we don't see our embodiment as separate from our environment. To the contrary, it's all related and relational and um, uh, uh, together in, in living this within the environment. And I would like to um, invite uh, you to, to expand perhaps on that because there were so many really interesting ideas in your presentation. I would really appreciate um, a little bit more um, uh, uh, details and in, in how, uh, or, or maybe more, um, for you to enlighten us and, uh, on how the, the work that you do on Tayal identity and language and how it is embodied in the land and in the environment. Um, that would be my, my request. I'm thinking should Ben uh, address this <laughs> radical relationalism and then I can follow or I mean I mean Monica it was such a great reflection of the things we said um the power difference is very, is something I try to really point towards now and I saw myself struggling with it um you know borrowing from the powerful and how this kind of works and actually when we were writing this paper both Vashaka and I really liked the term of allyship um, our third co-author couldn't see any, they couldn't understand this term even. It's like, he was very like, why do you need this new nuance? He was even said, this is a, like a new word, what is this? <laughs> it's like, it's like exactly pointing at this delicate power relationship, I think. Um, that's why I kind of, why I really liked it. Um, now maybe I maybe wanted to say just one more thing that also while writing this paper, um, <clears throat> At first, we were very, um, and this points towards, I think also Jenna mentioned, uh, you know, the different coloniality in a way that, you know, in different contexts that it expresses differently. And we were very, I think, maybe too radical in the beginning uh, that we just said, some st substantialist viewpoints are colonial. And also that that all of them are, uh, <laughs> basically, and that, uh, you know, also doesn't really matter the, the context in a way. And we really wanted to make this this, uh, you know, bundle them basically together. So colonial is substantialist and relational is 
Yeah, well, hopefully less so. Or like sometimes we said indigenous, but uh, you know, radical relationalism might be also colonial. So we we are really struggling with with drawing these strong arguments. Uh, and in the end, it was a very toned down version that is in this uh, in this article. Um, but yeah, Vashak, you want to tell us some more about the uh, Dayal people? Yeah, uh, thank you, Monica, for the question. And thank you, Yana, for sharing the two I seeing because this is something that I'm struggling just to put a, a, a short term, short a sharing that uh, I did not see myself as a Dayan person until the my university because I was brought up basically in a mixed uh, um, ethnicity uh, family and my grandmother who was a Dayan who did not speak Dayan to my father and he she certainly did not speak Dayan to me because this language and culture was regarded as something that is dead and it has no practical value in the future so um so it was really a coming into terms for me um in my doctoral process then I really get to see that the uh, like aging and care in indigenous communities through doing this project that I see that, okay, so Dayan people, they're so, so it's somewhere inside my family, but I never see the value before. So, so like last year, I, I, I wrote a, a, a publication with a, with a co-author from, from a, a mentor also from Norway that we try to talk about this story of how this kind of person from a mixed race family could reclaim this kind of identity using indigenous methodologies. So we're making a claim that um, uh, really like uh, doing indigenous methodologies is not a what questions, but a how questions and your indigeneity is about how you embrace this indigeneity or how to do it. And for me, I had been uh, so often, somebody will look at my face and see that, oh, you're not indigenous. You look too white. You don't have this good accent. You don't speak perfectly. You don't have the plant knowledge that you're supposed to have. So 40 years ago, we were scolded for not being Han Chinese enough. And now we're being uh, front upon because we are not indigenous enough. So it is just another reproduction of colonial gaze um, that uh, we're experiencing, at least in Taiwan, I don't know about like in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. But um, so going back to reflecting on this, uh, the, this living language in the land, I think in Dayan language, at least what I'm learning now is that a lot of this environment, it's, um, um, this vocabulary that I know to describe different uh, body parts, it also exists in describing the geology, uh, the geography, or how the landscape is formed. So there is no a strict distinction of like, oh, that is nature and and uh, it's external to us. So for for our at least the elders, they are kind of living in the nature, and then they are. It is not the nature that's external to them, but then it's kind of also um, a way that you need to to know how to survive. And then you might be eaten by the creatures inside, but then it is just how things were. So, um, so I think um, it's a it's definitely a living language in the environment. And I would really hope that in the future there's a chance for the radical relationalism seminar that all of you you can come to Taiwan, we should really walk into the Cypress Forest. I think it's very difficult to explain in front of the Zoom, but then if we can walk together and then we can be in the forest that is 2,500 years old, and you can really feel that it's a, we're in a different kind of space and different mind and how the, the knowledge of Diane is being implemented and how we are fighting to really co-manage or co-design the forest could be protected and it's a, it's a really ongoing process and i hope we can do that maybe in the in the future but uh i think for now i will i'll just stop here <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much for that reflection washak i um i feel sometimes similar things with identity and reclamation 
Um, as some of you know, I'm I'm from Mexico. I was brought up in Mexico City among, um, and and much of what you mentioned there, Victor, as well with this whole uh, bits of culture that are allowed to exist as kind of I don't know like mementos or um, that 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 people identify as indigenous and yet are kind of appropriated back. Um, uh, in a way that 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 is colonial and perpetuates this idea of superior inferior, maybe not even saying superior inferior, but kind of um, implying it. In 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 my own story, I I I still hesitate to 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 embrace the indigenous identity because I myself was brought up in a in an urban uh, modern mestizo. Um, modern Mexican mestizo identity, which is itself very racist in the sense that it's more like a whitening um, kind of project, uh, and yet still embracing elements of the of the local indigeneities that are, um, it, it's, it's uh, what the decolonial authors say is that when, when uh, Spain, encountered the what they called the new world of course it was not new it had been there uh, long ago <laughs> but when they encountered it that for them was that that encountering of that radical like alterity the radical other that they were finding um in this in this place and that was in the well 1492 is the date so 1500s and it's really old and the kind of relationships that have happened since then um, tend to be, I would, I would say a lot more like um, intricately um, um, embedded and enmeshed and it's hard to, 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 to separate the bits that, um, could could lead to to a, to a more of an an indigenous um, identity, even though the 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 experience is different. There weren't um, in Mexico. Basically, indigenous peoples were um, uh, uh, neglected and left uh, uh, to their own devices. So the languages is, exist and persist. There's still Nahuatl, which is the language of my ancestors. Nahuatl speakers. I don't speak the language, and 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 perhaps that should be my next thing. But I've been reading about the the Nahuatl history and um, uh, feeling very closely with a princess, a Nahuatl, an Aztec, badly called Aztec, Mexica princess, uh, uh, called Flower Shield, and uh, feeling about trying to reconnect intergenerationally in a way with that history. But I don't know, I, I just feel this kind of imposter syndrome, um, right, of trying to embrace that kind of um, identity and history so far away from, from modern Mexico and so imbricated with the uh, colonial uh, way of thinking and being that um, it, it kind of... Um, it leaves us without without necessarily a recourse, or I don't know. When I'm when I'm here in Canada with the more uh, um, uh, recent, or I don't know if it's recent, but with the with the with the more with a clearer uh, sense of indigeneity, um, it's it's hard to to even think of myself as as as, as indigenous, and yet I have grown up with. Uh, ways of uh, like associated with the word Indian since I was a little girl um, in that kind of discriminatory um, a sense in the in the different um, in the different ways in which we uh, look at this uh, identities um, and the decolonial perspective has helped me uh, uh, look at it but 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 even then the decolonial Latin American thinkers are white guys, right? That have uh, this, and they're and they're talking about how the intramural uh, colonial difference there in Europe. Uh, uh, that's why uh, Victor's uh, presentation last session was really 
telling in the sense how it's looking at the Balkans, right? This is the intramural um, colonial difference, like the Spanish speaking world is unable to do philosophy, for example, right? And that's the that's the world in which I grew up. And that was the kind of um, uh, identity issue that since we're all Spanish speakers in Latin America and, 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 and those, and those indigenous languages seem to be um, farther away from us. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling now, but it's, it's an interesting, I guess, uh, way of looking at, uh, at identity and, and this relationship with the colonial order that has affected everyone. Um, so, um, and, and just to, to give uh, some terms, the decolonial um, uh, authors, at least Mignolo speaks about the possibility of a cosmopolitan localism. And perhaps that's, that's, uh, that's a useful term. But maybe that's what we want with relationalism or radical relationalism to help us put together terms that are useful for finding these allyships and um, yeah. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to comment on this. Maybe just on the very last one, because because uh, I think yes that, that that this is something that Mignolo is on there where he's onto something. <laughs> I think not to, to, I'm not that well versed with uh, the rest of his work, of course. Um, but that, that that's why I tried to say that I think relationalism can really be a key in this to to find this. So like I think like when we say. Um, but this 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 kind of decolonial notion of cosmopolitanism, not that we are all becoming the same, but that we are all the same in our difference or something like that. That's how at least how I kind of understand it. We have this connection because wherever you go, it is different, and that's how we are connected. Um, maybe that's not decolonial cosmopolitanism, but that's how I want to see it. But that um, but that there's still this like uh, in a way what we find actually when we look at these local communities or marginalized or indigenous uh, and you know probably th that's what we had you know once somewhere everywhere is this focus on relations like that seems to be really stressed in many of these um works where we talk when we look at the tayal that's very uh, present and that was uh, you know i see it also in many other places where i read about and feel like this is this connecting piece maybe that is missing to really bring this idea home of this cosmopolitanism uh, that is not this Western Kantian idea of cosmopolitanism, which is the exact opposite. <laughs> That's actually why I, I really don't like this term because it's too easy to be confused. Um, that's yeah why this you know pluriversalism or universal localism or something like this, I think it's it's better. Um, yeah, just to jump on the last thing to say with another ramble. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Would anyone else like to chime in with a comment or? Jo Jonathan. Yeah, uh, th thank you for uh, for the presentations. Maybe two uh, questions. Yeah, I also... Uh, I'm not very uh, familiar with Mignola, but I also, from the very beginning, started uh, wondering about what this um, cosmopolitan localism actually kind of means. It's it's still a bit un unclear to me how we can distinguish it from. Um, uh, so so you uh, made the claim that kind of this Kantian cosmopolitanism is kind of the exact opposite. I don't know if for those who are more familiar, maybe. Um, a, a quick uh, overview one how do, how do we identify whether we're being cosmopolitan localists and uh, and second for maybe a a, a point of clarification uh, so on the research you're doing on the tayan people am i pronouncing that right uh, ah okay very good um so i understand that you're you you're uh, seeking to explain um I, I didn't quite understand what, what what it is you're starting to explain. Is it the Tayan identity as as such? Uh, you had a, a, an interesting uh, uh, 
a, a graph there or, or, or some sort of uh, sch uh, schematic. Um, can you maybe uh, unpack it very quickly for me? So what, what explains this Tayan identity there? I, I saw some terms that I, of course, didn't uh, uh, recognize. I, um, so yeah, maybe unpack the explanation that you're giving just out of curiosity. Uh, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Shall I start just with a little, little yeah, please do. Talk, talking about the the full term is decolonial, and perhaps that's what what tries to take away on the Kantian universalism, decolonial cosmopolitan localism, and this is where uh, Mignolo lands. Um, so he 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 articulates this this concept. Um, uh, but doesn't quite engage in how we can, like the methodology of how we can uh, do this properly. Is it, it ends in 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 um, similar similar with Marx and communism is like it's all going to be harmony and and love and 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 happiness. But he doesn't really explain how we're going to do this. That's and that's more or less the 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 kind of work that I'm engaged with uh, through reflexive politics. But um, what the what he lands there basically by providing a very uh, detailed um, discussion, and in many of his works and publications, but but the last uh, uh, book that I would uh, recommend is his um, decolonial investigations, and he's basically talking about the colonization uh, and the history of colonization and 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 resorts to. Enrique Dussel and uh, Aníbal Quijano's ideas of the of the colonial matrix of power, uh, Quijano's colonial matrix of power, and Dussel's ideas that um, there is this modernity coloniality that are intricately uh, um, meshed, and that the the col the colonial masters of the world only show the the modern progressive emancipatory powers and they do not show that they stand on the colonial uh, impulse to death and dispossession and exploitation and it stands on it in a way uh, Dussel speaks about how the Cartesian ego cogito is not ego cogito on its own it stands on an awareness. It's so powerful. And it stands on an awareness, and Dussel calls it an ego conquero that precedes the ego cogito and that is uh, aware of that power through the coloniality or the colonial order that they imposed on uh, the whole of uh, Latin America or, or, or the, the, the initial, that, that alterity that was supposedly discovered in 1492. Um, so all of that is what uh, Mignolo engages with and what he says is, but all the colonial peoples that were dispossessed, exploited, and uh, um, subjugated under the idea of race, basically, that's, that's the idea that was created to uh, uh, invent some kind of inferiority, uh, barbarity, right, the, the, the other. Um, that that um, is uh, uh, the dispossession is of course for exploitation and for land, but also it's the dispossession of all those ways of knowing and being that are ancestral and well alive, because they're related to to that local side to the land in the indigenous ways of knowing that exist to this day everywhere in the world. They're very resilient and they are there. And so what Mignolo ends and lands on is this decolonial cosmopolitan localism so that each one of those local perspectives are considered and taken into account. And then if you are going to create some kind of governance in a specific area, that land, that local uh, uh, way of, of being and knowing here in, 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 in Kamloops, BC, it would be the, the Shikwetmek way of 
knowing and being. So um, uh, uh, one of our um, uh, cultural advisors, indigenous advisors in, in, in the university, Ted Gottfriedson says, we're, we're not really talking about indigenizing the university, we're talking about shukwetmetizing the university because that's the land in which this university is sitting. That's the local relevance. And it's decolonial and it's cosmopolitan in the sense that, and I know it's that maybe we change that world, but but that's the term that Mignolo uses. And it's to say it has the value that ought to be relevant for everyone in the world. And that's the framework in which I I was thinking about when 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 I was mentioning if you don't have a framework that is uh, in, in, in a decolonial valuing of all the local perspectives or ways of knowing, then, then it's, it's universal, it's universalist and it's colonial, but also has this kind of nationalism or, or, or what the decolonial Latin American thinkers call this European parochial way of thinking. Is in the end, it's very parochial. It's not universalist. They try to, and they, right, the, the cants of the world try to say, oh, this is the universe. No, it's, it can't never left his town. <laughs> he speaks about cosmopolitanism and he's being like, an, uh, you're right, uh, just sitting in his living room, never visited any, any part of the world. And yet he was talking about this cosmopolitan perspective. Anyways, that's... That's my ramble. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. <laughs> that was very good. You, know, you would have fit right into uh, the topic, I guess, of decolonizing. Uh, Vashak, you want to see your microphone is up? You want to take this? Or? Yeah, I was actually, I, I wasn't so sure about if I understood Jonathan's uh, question uh, correctly, but just to. <laughs> Uh, maybe you just reflect and maybe Ben, you can jump in afterwards, is that uh, so the, the investigation or the article that we're doing is that the government has been like really drawing this causal or this very substantive line of like, we give you more language textbook, then we give you more language hours, and you're supposed to feel more proud about being Diane. And then you should be automatically being able to speak more Diane in your everyday life. But then it was not the case. So what we want, wanted to do through our um our, our paper is that seeing all this constitutive element of what is missing from the government's point of view of its this idea about capacity of proficiency or language um uh, language proficiency is not as narrow as the government sees it, but it's more broadly and it should be incorporated of how the local Diane people or how we talk about this uh, um, like a uh, cosmopolitan localism is like how our situated knowledge has enabled us to to see what language means really in the whole holistic environment but yeah but if Ben you want to say more please <laughs> well I'm, I know that Jonathan is the expert on explanation so I'm very curious to also hear what he thinks about this um but maybe also more more technical than we are trying to to ground our explanation of what is tile identity or what are the constitutive elements that re are required for this tile identity reclamation um, that basically the explanation to this requires a constitutive or relational approach where we look at all these different aspects and what you were asking so uh, we're basically looking at yes language but also the the environment, the setting of uh, where the tayal are, their their ways, so their kind of the laws, but also worldview. Um, I, I also we mentioned intergenerational connections, spiritual connections. That all of these constitutive elements need to be kind of considered to give this uh, relational explanation, which is which is actually the. I don't know. Is that the only way to understand tayal identity? I think so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that this is what it's required. Um, and the government basically is looking for a non-relational explanation to, you know, the question of how do we, uh, well, they would even use, you know, I, I, you could see like increase tile identity. Like how do you even like measure this or like there's some, this this disconnect of a, approach and policy 
to to do to the actual kind of reality. Um, yes. What do you think, Jonathan? <laughs> um, um, so uh, you had uh, this uh, diagram of the explanation where you know everything is is, is connected to everything else. Um, uh, my kind of worry with this kind of thing is that you can pretty much substitute the diagram by simply saying that everything is connected to everything else. Um, if you, from what I, uh, uh, you, you brought out the contrast, this rather uh, simplistic uh, causal explanation where uh, lang uh, like language skill causes strengthening of Tayan identity. I mean, that's obviously... You no, know, we're we're missing a lot of important stuff uh, there. But if you want to uh, influence policymakers, they're going to have a lot more to do with the first one than the second one. Um, so uh, I, I, I I'm looking forward to reading your your, your paper. Uh, just that as, as an explanation, uh, I I don't know. I I tend to think of explanations as answers to why questions. And sometimes we explain why by showing how. Uh, Wasik also mentioned that you're you're interested in the how question, right? So how we do things is uh, is 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 constitutive of Tayan identity. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I I'm I don't think I can say anything more then. But if you uh, ever uh, have the paper ready, I, I'm I'm glad to uh, glad to read it. It's it's uh, certainly uh, an interesting topic. Um, yeah. It is it is ninety eight percent ready. Actually, we just got the final version, and Shaka and I need to still check it, and then we will submit it. So, mm -hmm. also the graphic is not in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> so no misleading arrows uh, in it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I make the graph. It would be nice. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I wonder if what you just mentioned there, Jonathan, is 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 I I find it useful to say an explanation of the how. Yeah. Um, not just, you know, everything's connected with everything else, which is really a basic assumption of radical relationism. That's what, what that's what it is. That ev everything that we can see as a substance is really a, 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 a cluster of relations. And, uh, but then perhaps a constitutive explanation, which is again, something that you know about, um, would that include perhaps a how um are, are we are we collapsing method with um methodology with with the um with ontology i don't just mm -hmm. wondering <laughs> well I, my own thoughts are i think well what any explanation should do is enable us to tell um Tell us what uh, how things would be different if you change something. So when it comes to Tayan identity, we have an explanation. If if you can tell us if uh, you change something uh, about you know what it is that people do, then what what would be different? Then we have this kind of structure of you know counterfactual dependencies. Uh, uh, so I, I'm uh, yeah. I, I, I mean that that's that's the way I understand explanations, which is a pretty typical view, and I think that holds for constitutive explanations as uh, as well. Uh, so if we have a diagram, we should be it should not only say that you know everything is connected to everything else, but it should say how everything is connected to everything else. So if you change one thing in the diagram, what else has to change somewhere else? Uh, mm. Yeah. So my, I don't know if if that matches what you're doing at all. Uh, or if it's even even important, <laughs> and in flux at the same time, in flux and and dynamic moving. Yeah, of course. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I was just looking if we are asking any questions in the paper. <laughs> They're just implicitly there. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't really address what the, the language revitalization, which were mainly asked by the linguists who were a very long time in the indigenous territories, like asking how can we preserve the language better if we switch this uh, uh, variables better and would that be a better outcome? If we give you one dictionary, will you be able to speak language like uh, from B1 to C1? 
like uh, but we were not really I think focused so much on the on that aspect in terms of policy reclamation but we are more like uh, asking the the framing of the policy question more interpretively where how the so the policy was usually done in a way that external to the indigenous community. And what we are trying to make in this article is more about how the community ourselves see the question in our own way. And hopefully the next paper could be that how could the policy be framed in a way that would be more relevant, more culturally and sovereignty wise relevant to our own way of being and way of thinking. If that makes sense, it totally does. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I think when thinking back, especially on this constitutive explanation, maybe explanation is a is a term that is not fully fitting. But we, I, I feel like we were following the question of kind of what makes uh, tile identity or what constitutes. Right, would be the. Um, can you rephrase that as a how question? Uh, maybe, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think this this kind of sits at the at the heart of the paper. So that's a question of understanding, I guess, in the classical sense. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So a debate between explanation and understanding. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I personally don't think that's a very productive debate, but I'm just. No. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I, uh, I from uh, a very rich and thick description of what Tayan identity means is a very laudable goal. Uh, just from my own point of view, not everything has to be an explanation. Yeah. Uh, maybe this word needs to be. Uh, well, we're phrasing it a little bit in the paper, like um, so. We have this kind of yeah thick empirical description in a way. And then uh, there's this like, so radical relationalism, how can it kind of help us interpret this? And one aspect of it is that it, you know, you know conceives of relations that's also constitutive of the, of the elements. And there the word explanation dropped in the, uh, in this section. So maybe it's, maybe it shouldn't be there. I'm not sure right now. <laughs> what well, other concepts? Sorry. sorry, sorry. No, no, no. I'm just rambling. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing we're close to the hour and a half, which is the 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 length of these sessions. And I just wanted to say this is just so uh so great, so many things to think and reflect about. And I want to invite everyone to to keep thinking about how do we decolonize radical relationism in order to really make it, um, uh, I don't know if a framework or a way of building bridges, um, that is one of the um, answers that I had heard from another indigenous philosopher, uh, Leroy Little Bear. And I see Jenna, Jenna's hand up. Would you like to say some conclusive remarks, Jenna? Uh, not not precisely concluding, just to thank um, everyone for so much for kind of gathering together and, and thinking about these uh, issues collectively in, in such open ways. It's really refreshing and nice to, to listen to a group of scholars kind of struggling <laughs> um, to, to really articulate appropriate ways of decolonizing, right? Uh, when that center um, indigenous ways of knowing and being the world, but also that center of the complexity of what that is. It's not a simple thing uh, at all. So I wanted to say how much I appreciated that. And also to uh, ask, um, uh, one, of my, one of my students is doing a research on indigenous identity. Uh, and as soon as you're well, ready and willing to share that paper, I'd love for uh, the student to have access to it if, if you'd be willing to share it uh, early, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> um, but just wanted to, yeah, end off by, by saying, uh, well, the, as they say here, uh, which is uh, thank you for all very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna, Kukschechem, everyone. And uh, looking forward to our next session 
uh, which will be a discussion of radical relational pedagogies. Um, it's uh, our March discussion and um, will be, it's posted in the website. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Monica.